Today we are doing tree diagrams, the last part of our probability unit. You guys are going to be able to use tree diagrams to calculate probabilities. A tree diagram is another way to basically provide a visual to help you find probabilities, just like what a Venn diagram is, a sample space, things like that. Okay, so we're going to use tree diagrams to calculate probabilities. What is a tree diagram? Well, it looks like this, okay? You have these straight lines, which are called your branches, and the probabilities for um, different events happening. So say this is event A and this is event B. The probabilities of these two events happening are located on your actual branches. Okay? So let's say the probability of event A happening is uh, 3 fourths. And then you'll have the probability of event B happening with the, on the actual um, branch itself. And the one thing you do need to be aware of is that the branches always total one, okay? Or 100%, depending on if they're um, fractions or percentages. So A is one, uh, three fourths, we know B is automatically one fourth. one fourth, okay? Sometimes they'll give you one event that happens and you have to use that to figure out the event of something else happening, okay? And this is also important that you do read like those two or three lines beforehand because they'll, they'll actually tell you your probabilities that you'll use to create your tree diagram. Something else that's also going to trip you guys up that I can see happening is that if they give you a tree diagram with blanks, and you automatically just start filling in the blanks, but the directions say copy and complete. If it says copy and complete the tree diagram, that means you have to redraw the tree diagram in order to get the points. Don't just fill in. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. So, let's just go ahead and jump into an example. It says two fair dice are rolled, one red and one blue. We are going to find the probability that these four things happen. Now we get a double six, no sixes, exactly one six, and at least one six are rolled. Alright, two fair dice are rolled. We have one red and one blue. Okay? So, and I don't want you to think it's like, okay, we're rolling the red die uh, and the blue die at the same time. Think of it as like you're rolling a red die and you're rolling a blue die, or vice versa, you're rolling the blue die, rolling the red die. Okay? Does the outcome of one event, the outcome of what goes on the red and what happens on the blue, do they have anything to do with each other? No. Okay? Because whatever happens on the red die has no effect on what happens on the blue die. So you can kind of represent this as a tree diagram to just kind of help you with the probabilities. Now, if you can figure it out without one, then that's fine, but I'm trying to harp on tree diagrams. So you start with the initial point, and you draw two branches here, okay? These branches basically represent your outcome. When you roll the red die, okay, there are two things that could happen. When you roll the red die, there are two things that can happen. What are the two things for this particular scenario? There are two things that can happen. You can get a, say again? You're either going to end up getting a six or not getting a six. And we're looking at these two probabilities instead of getting a, a one, two, three, four, five, or six because every single one of these questions says either a six or not a six. Those are your two outcomes. Now, with these two outcomes, what are the probabilities? What's the probability of rolling a six? A one six. What's the probability of not rolling a six? Five, five six. Five six. And you know that not because there are five other numbers on the six sided die, but because if one branch is one six, the other one has to be five six. It has to make it a whole. So you roll the red die. Now you're gonna roll the blue die. If you roll a six on the red die, you're still gonna have two outcomes on the blue die. What are your two outcomes on the blue die? Six and not a six. Who's on the blue die? If you roll something other than a six on your red die, you're still going to have two outcomes. What are those two outcomes? A six and not a six. And again, we're getting these outcomes based off of what our question is asking us. It's basically asking us to figure out what's the probability of getting a six, no six, one six, or at least a six. So we're only concerned about six. And everything, and anything that's not. What's the probability that 
you do roll a six on the blue dot. Not a six. Are those going to be the same probabilities for this branch? Yes. Because again, rolling the red dot has no effect on rolling the blue dot. Is everyone with me so far? Yes, it's a little bit
No, so that's basically saying that when you roll these two die, the red die and the blue die, if you get at least one six, then what was the probability that the red die showed the six? That's what it's saying. So we're looking at what type of probability here? Conditional. Conditional. Keyword given. So our denominator is going to be what? Like, uh, not, not the number, but what's... It's going to be uh, at least one six. At least one six. Okay? So remember, whatever is given is always the denominator. And if you want to write it out using conditional probability, we want a red six given that at least one six was shown. So the numerator is basically going to be the intersection between the fact that we got a red 6 and at least 1 was shown. That is the breakdown. Any questions before we go forward? So we already have the probabilities listed from the other slide. Right? Yeah. What was the probability that rolled a red six and at least one six was shown. Based on the previous tables, mm -hmm. we got one thirty-six that um, the low denominator was six and the size of the red one was six, so that's six over by the red one. Mm -hmm. We're looking at these right here. These were the three where at least one six was rolled, correct? Correct. And so out of these three possible outcomes, didn't we have two of the outcomes that had a red six? Yeah. Yep. So the probability are the sum of these two, which would be what? Six out of 36. Six out of 36. So that is our numerator. And we already answered the denominator in one of the previous questions. What's the probability that at least one six is rolled? So all you do, you change flip or realize that the denominators are going to go away. At this point, you just simplify. Yep. And what do you get? Six over 11. Six over 11. The 36s are going to end up canceling each other out, and then that's the probability of this particular situation. With this particular example, I would like you, after you get it written down, I would like you to draw your tree diagram that represents the situation, okay, before we start answering all these questions. All right, so basically, uh, you have the situation that's talking about rain. It says the probability that it will rain today is 0.2. <coughs> if it rains today, the probability that it will rain tomorrow is 0.15. If it is fine today, no rain, then the probability that it will be fine tomorrow is 0.9. So that, in those uh, two sentences, three sentences, it basically tells you what this should look like as your tree diagram, okay? When you start off, this first uh, set of events is basically the first day. What are the things that can happen on this first day? Rain. It can rain or it will be fine. Now it tells you that the probability that it will rain today is 0.2. So if it rains today and that's 0.2, what's the probability that it will be fine today? 0.8. So then we have tomorrow. And so if it rains today, what could happen tomorrow? It could rain or fine. It could rain or it could be fine. Well, according to the description, it says that if it rains today, then the probability that it will rain tomorrow is 0.15. So we have 0.15 there. But if it rains today, what's the probability that it will be fine tomorrow? 0.15. Because it has to add to be 1. You'll have the same type of outcomes for tomorrow as well. What do you know already? It is 0.9 percent. 
29, it'll be fine tomorrow, but it's fine today. So that means it'll be what if it rains tomorrow? 24 tomorrow. And that's what your tree diagram should have looked like. Okay? Yes, all the branches. So all the all of these, these are branches, should add up to be one. Point two, point eight is, is one. Here, point fifteen, point eighty five adds to be one. Here, point one and point nine adds to be one. Oh, okay. so each, okay. so each, each, each two branches have to be one. Exactly. Okay, that's what the whole thing should accomplish. Cool. Alright, so it says find the probability that at least one day will be fine. The probability that at least one day will be fine. Well, that could happen if it rains and then it's fine. That could be that it's fine and then it rains. And then that could be that it's fine both days. It could rain both days, but for part A, it's asking us to find the probability that at least one day will be fine. What's the probability that it will be? It will rain, but it'll be fine. Point one seven, seventeen out of one hundred. What about this fine that it rains? Four out of fifty. Point zero eight. Uh, you multiply along the branches, so the branch for rain <coughs> and the branch for fine. What about the probability that's fine both days? Uh, so if you find the probability that you find at least one day, you'll add up all of these numbers. 0. 0.97. Uh, your mark scheme will give it to you, uh, will give it to me as decimal, uh, but it will have a fraction conversion as well. So if you did 17 out of 100, 8 out of 100, or 72, 72 out of 100, that will be correct as well. Yes? Wait, so what about the um, That's the point one seven. So if it rains today but not tomorrow, that means it's fine tomorrow. So then that's that's that separate probability. That's another probability. I, did, I just didn't need it to answer part A. So I didn't do it. But we can do it. What is that probability? 0 0.03. And again, all four of these add up to be one whole. All right. So this one here is just given that at least one day is fine. Right there, conditional probability. What is the probability that it was today? So we already know our denominator needs to be the probability that at least one day will be fine. What is that? 0.97, the same answer you got for part A, and it will happen like that a lot of times. You'll basically find part of your answer in a previous problem. Now, out of those three outcomes, the ones that are in the blue, what is the probability that today was the fine day? Just 0.08. Just 0.08? 0.08 plus 0.72, which is what? 0.8. So the probability, of course you want to type that in and get either one fraction or one decimal. That will be the probability that today was fine given that at least one day was fine. Point eight. Point 0.8 to 5, you're going to round up three significant figures. However, remember, if we are a rounding issue, we can always convert to a fraction. How do you convert that to a fraction? Math. 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 Enter, math. enter, enter. What is the fraction? 80 over 97. 80 over 97. Well, that's, that was the work that went along with it. Oh, so I can't do that. Yeah. And then how do we go from oh, okay. like, eight to point nine seven? We divide it. Point eight divided by point nine seven. Now, C says, given that at least one day is fine, so again, we have another point nine seven at the bottom. What is the probability that both are fine? And that's your numerator. 
So you wouldn't want to leave it like this. You would actually want to divide them to get one decimal or a nice clean fraction. You'll get 72 over 97 or 742. Did you run it correctly? Good job. How are we with tree diagrams? Great. Let's just make sure that we can, you know, this problem is a little bit different from the other problem, okay? <laughs> There are six peppermints and two licorice candies in a bag for a total of how many candies in the bag? Eight. 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 Now it says a candy is picked and not replaced in the bag. Okay? So, and then, and then a second candy is picked. So this one is a little bit different from the other ones because it's basically one of those situations where you reach into the bag and there are originally eight candies in the bag. But once you pick out a candy, you don't replace it. So then there's seven candies left. Not, necess not necessarily. The, the probability problem. just takes a hit. Right? The problem just takes a hit. Yeah, so um, you want to make the three parts. That's not yeah. addition. I know, but then, but it's just. But, okay. Yeah, I'll talk it out because I'm going to write something that works. So, six out, like, six out of eight for candy actually, like, for example, two out of eight for candy. Okay, so wait. I have, I have two branches. What goes here? Uh, peppermint. And what goes here? Awesome. So on this branch, you said I have what? Six out of eight. Uh huh. And two out of eight. Very good. On the peppermint branch, I'm five out of seven. I have one out of eight. And two out of seven is one out of eight. Mm-hmm. So two branches are one out of eight. Six out of seven is one out of eight. And one out of seven is one out of eight. Very good. Eight and one plus two. Good job. So we start out with eight candies, six peppermints, and two licorice. And depending on if you pick a peppermint, that's one less peppermint candy that you have. That's why it's five out of seven, because you do not replace it. So you lose one peppermint candy, because that's the one that you picked, and you're losing one candy overall. So the denominator is seven, the numerator is five. But you still have two licorice inside of the bag. And then the same thing for licorice. You start off with two, but if you pick a licorice, that means there's only one left out of the seven, but there's still all six peppermints. So you have your tree. So you guys should be able to answer your two questions. I want you to answer A and B. A and B. Find the probability that one of each type is chosen. One of each type is chosen. What you guys come up with? Yeah. Oh, I got three out of 16. Three out of 14, three out of 16? I got three out of 14. I got four. Yeah, it's my right math. Enter. Yeah. Uh, seven. Three over seven. Three yeah. over seven? Look, I did okay. One of each type. That oh. means you choose peppermint, licorice, or licorice, peppermint. It's those two probabilities added up together. So the probability that you get a peppermint and then a licorice, that's going to be 12 out of 56. Probability that you get a licorice and a peppermint is another 12 out of 56. So that's a total of 24 out of 56, which does reduce down to which of the fractions that you guys just told me. Mine. Three out of seven. That was your answer. The probability that each type is chosen. Now it says, given that one of each type is chosen, we already know the denominator. If one of each type is chosen, that means three over seven is your denominator. I mean, sorry, not 57. I was thinking the already reduced answer. Sorry, 56. If one of each type was chosen out of these two, what is the probability that the first one chosen was peppermint? Uh, one half, right? Yeah. Yeah. Overall is 0.5. Overall is 0.5. What's the numerator here? Uh, the, 12 out of the 12 out of 56. Because out of these two options, because these are the only two we're looking at, one type was chosen of each, we need the first one to be the peppermint. So 12 out of 56 is your numerator. 3 out of 7 is your denominator, and that does simplify down to be 1 half. So even when you're not replacing uh, the ball that you pick or the candy that you pick or whatever that's coming out of a bag or a jar or whatever situation you have, you want to make sure that you take into account if you replace or if you do not replace it. And anytime you have multiple probabilities that fit a certain situation like A did, you want to add those two properties, uh, probabilities together. That's how we got 24 out of 56. Question. 
by when you multiply the two fractions together, six eighths and two sevenths, six times two is twelve, eight times seven is eight sixths. It, it could be. If you if you reduce it all Yeah, if you reduce any of these fractions, then yes, um, like the original one will be uh, what you get will be a, a tad bit different, but it's still the same thing. Remember, I'm not too concerned about the reducing of fractions. You don't have to worry about reducing your fractions. Y'all stop talking to me. And plus, just like with the rounding issue, you know, who knows what you may type into your calculator, so just, you know, be very cautious, be very careful. Uh, when you, well, I'm going off of what your classmate said. I do it all the way. But if you keep, change, flip it, you can either multiply straight across or you can do a shortcut. What I like to do is, does three go into 12? Yeah. Four times, right? Yeah. Doesn't 56 go into seven? Okay. How many? Eight times. So you'll have four over eight, which reduces down to one half. Now remember what I said about if you did it all in your calculator. If you try to type this large fraction in there, you want to make sure that you put parentheses around your numerator and parentheses around your denominator. Okay? That's how you get one. Do you see where the original two fractions came from? It might be how you look at three calculations. So this is like combining with it. One thing that I always like doing this problem because there might be a situation where you're presented with a problem and you need to know a little bit of background about certain sports, even if you've never played a sport. If you never watched tennis or if you never played tennis, knowing how the game works is very important because if you didn't know how this game worked, and you had to create a tree diagram yourself, this might be pretty difficult. But how tennis works is that the player steps up and he has to serve, or she has to serve. Two things can happen, they get the serve in or they get the serve out. If they get the serve in, it's played out. And so either you either win or you lose the point. If you get the serve out, you have a second opportunity to serve. Now if you get it in, you play it out, you can win or lose. But if you get it out the second time, then you lose that particular point and it goes to the other player. So knowing certain things about other sports and other games is going to be important. Okay? So if there's ever a situation where we're going over an example and you're like, you don't know about it just because you know we weren't taught it or you don't play it or whatever, you just need, you need to let me know. Okay? Because you can't ask those questions on test day. Everybody understand that? Anybody never watched tennis or didn't know that about tennis? You learn something new today. There you go. All right? Say that you play it six. All right. So, would you guys, um, if Andy plays 10 to 65% of the serves go in, so that means point thirty five go out. If his first serve goes in, then they have, he has a chance of winning the point is 90%. So, what goes here? 0. 0.9. 0. 0.9. And plus, you knew that if it was, he lose uh, 10% of the time, then clearly he won 90% of the time. However, if his first serve goes out and he serves it again, if it goes in, there are his outcomes, but if it goes out, clearly, what goes here? One. One, because you lose the point 100% if it goes out both times. So you have to find the probability that Andy loses that <coughs> point, or loses the point. What did you guys get your final answer? Um, 0.247. You guys get 0.247? Yeah. Good. If you didn't get 0.247, these are the branches you should have looked, looked at. This first over goes in, and then he loses. That's 0 0.65 times 0 0.1. Okay? That's also, he, it goes out, but then it goes in, but then he loses. That's 0 0.35 times 0.8 times 0.4. And then, of course, if it goes out, and then it goes out, he loses. That's 0 0.35, 0 0.2, and 1. You multiply all these together, and then add them up. And from our tennis person, that, that's pretty good, wouldn't you say? Okay. Well, he's a pretty 
a good tennis player because, you know, that's a low probability that you'll lose the point. Yeah. 